It was a Friday night, and I'd gone to bed early, as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off at around 10.30pm, only to wake up about an hour later to loud screams and people yelling profanities. I thought my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up, and I went out into the lounge room to ask her to turn it down a bit. Instead, the TV was off, and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes wide. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building, and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby of the building. The voices in question were coming directly from the lobby. I could not make out specifics. In my defense, I was half asleep, and the language of the country I live in is not my first language, but there was a lot of swearing involved. My first thought was that it was some kind of domestic dispute, but after listening, I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building, and to my horror, saw a message from one of the people in it that there were armed men in the building and that we should not leave our flats. The country I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime, and I had heard stories of armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks, but these had seemed fairly apocryphal to me. However, that was my first thought, that these men would kick down our doors and rob us. One of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside. I shushed him, and thankfully he obeyed. I heard a commotion in the apartment above me, and went out to my patio to see what was happening. I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over, and women and children screaming in terror. At this point I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that by now they would have robbed us already, if that's what they had planned to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our bigger dog silently stood watch outside the door of the shed, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I would find my smaller dog later, cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After ten extremely tense minutes, I heard the screeching of tires, signaling what I hoped were the perpetrators fleeing the scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said that the police had arrived, and breathing a huge sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby, there were zip ties that had been cut, and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. The man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and looked extremely shaken. Over the next few hours, the story would unfold. The man I saw with the gash on his face was the tenant in the upstairs apartment, the one that I'd heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import slash export business and for whatever reason had a sizable sum of money in cash hidden in his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep on Friday night. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of his car, and judging by the gash on his face, roughed him up a bit. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised by the security guard, and zip-tied him. The remainder of the group had gone up to the apartment, robbed it, and then fled the scene. It is fairly chilling to think that armed men were mere meters from my front door. So, to the armed men that stormed my apartment building to steal my neighbor's cash, let's not meet. Okay, so for context for this story, I live in a pretty rural area. We live on the outskirts of our town, which is already small compared to the populations of the other towns in California. We're about 15 minutes from the small town and 40 minutes from the main city. 
We live down a dirt road with some neighbors. Our house has no other fences attached to ours, and on two sides of the house is only fields and dirt roads. One side having a single house in the field, the other two sides have a couple neighbors down other roads, and nobody really interacts out here, except my dad talking to two of them sometimes. I was probably 12 when this happened. I had low self-esteem, and I wanted to start exercising more. I had been enrolled in a charter school due to bullying. I didn't really have many ways of exercise besides a treadmill that we owned. I wanted to start getting fresh air, so my mom suggested that since we live out here, that it would be peaceful to take walks down the back dirt road. I agreed, even though I was stubborn about it half the time, but we began walking and would go in the mid to late afternoon when it would start cooling down outside, but was still light. In case it got dark, we took our flashlights too. Being out here, it was notorious for stray dogs to sometimes make their way out here, and we would carry pepper spray and a mini bat, just in case one of them got vicious. However, a dog will play into this story. One day, my mom and I decided to go on a walk in the late afternoon, so me and my mom took off and started walking down the road. When you walk about a quarter of a mile down the road, you start to come towards a little cross-section. There's a road going left to the highway, a road going right to the neighbor's house, or the road goes straight down to a utility road. My mom and I discussed walking down the utility road to get a good walk in, since it went on for a while. When we started getting to the crossroad, this dog came out of nowhere. We were looking at it, and it was in the center of the road, staring at us. My mom and I looked at it, and my mom said that she got this weird feeling in her stomach that we needed to turn around and walk home. She grabbed my arm and started leading me back home. She then lets go so that we could walk. We were in the midst of walking when she looks ahead and stops to stare at something. I ask what she's looking at, and she points. A white car pulled up to our fence and quickly backed up and shot down the road on the side of our house. Mind you, nobody ever goes down this road except one old man that we know. Anyone else who does is usually scoping out my dad's tools to steal. My mom said she felt a bit uneasy because of it and pulled me to the edge of the dirt road, almost into the field. The car had driven to the highway and left, or so we thought. We continued walking back to our house when this car comes back and drives down the road we were walking alongside. I caught a glimpse and it was this smaller white car with black tinted windows that you couldn't see through. My mom instantly got a feeling of impending doom and pulled me into the field. Not too far, but far enough. We kept walking through the fields towards our house, getting closer now. When this car comes back down the road, my mom stops me in my tracks to see what the car is doing, and it drives back to our house and starts driving around really fast. My mom waits until the car drives back down the side road, and she tells me we need to start running. So that's what we did. We started running through the field, getting to one of the little sections near my yard. The car comes back and drives down the road, trying to cut us off. My mom and I are panicking at this point, and have no idea who this is and why they're acting like this. The car circles around again, and my mom drags me further to the right of where we were and told me we're going to run down into the ditch. When we get down into the ditch, the car comes back around and pulls to the edge of the ditch where we were. The front of the car was facing us, and all I could think about was if it drove down, it would hit my mom and I and probably kill us. My mom quickly put her arm in front of me and stood dead still while I was literally horrified and dropped our flashlight and my bottle. The car was getting ready to drive where we were and then suddenly they backed up and drove around the yard, going back down the side road to the highway. My mom and I felt like our souls left and she tells me to run, to not look back and to get to the front gate. I run up the ditch feeling my heart pounding. I run around the yard and towards the front gate, flinging it open, and I started running towards the front door. I did not hear my mom behind me. I was running to the door to open it. 
Right when I looked over, I saw the car coming back down the side road. I ran into the house, trying to catch my breath. I saw the car drive down the road, and I didn't see my mom, so I was panicking. I ran towards the sliding glass door, and suddenly my mom comes running towards it and flings it open. She runs in and locks it. She tells me to go lock the front door while I try to catch my breath, and I tell her I was scared because I had no idea where she was. She went to chug some water from the fridge and told me that when I was running, she was trying to shut the front gate when she noticed the car coming back down the road. She said she knew she wouldn't have time to follow me to the front door, so she ran behind my sister's car to stay out of view of the car, and when it drove back down the road, she took that opportunity to run to the back door since it was closer to my sister's car. It's crazy to think that if we hadn't seen that dog standing there in the road and decided to turn back, that we may have been run down. Fortunately, we never saw that car again, and I think it may have just been some crazy person or drug addict who just so happened to come down our road that day. This happened while I was in my early 20s. My best friend was always getting into risky shit. While she did various drugs, I was always more of a pothead. When they said pot was a gateway drug, I believe it's true to a certain extent with those who have addictive personalities. She definitely developed an addiction issue later on. My friend's name was KK. She was always down to meet people. She used to friend random people on Facebook or Instagram. She would ask me to hang out so that way when she met people, I was the buffer just in case they didn't like each other. One day she came over to my house unannounced and was like, Hey, let's go to my uncle's house because her aunt was there and her aunt had some goods. Her aunt's house happened to be down the road. Her aunt and uncle were known as dealers in the area, so we went. When we got there, she was like, Hey, I met this guy online. He goes by Joey Crack. Then she shows her aunt his pictures, and it was a wide-set man with a red goofy face, cornrow braids, face tattoos, and a gold grill. I laughed and said, Wow, Kay, you really know how to pick him. She had already invited him over, so upon his arrival, he comes out of nowhere and just walks right up to Kay and gives her a hug and gives everyone else there a kiss on the cheek. This part of town, there was nothing around but houses, a school, and some woods. The closest store was about 20 minutes, so it struck me as odd that he walked here. So it was me, Kay, her aunt, and the aunt's friend. We sit and get three joints in rotation. By this time, both her aunt and her friend are high as a kite on coke. They take a few puffs, then go inside the house, leaving me, Kay, and Joey Crack outside. Joey then starts asking us questions, like how we know each other, what we do for a living, and some other stuff. It was getting late, so I was telling her I was going to go home. She was like, no, don't go yet. I told her I was tired, and that Joey is weird, and he kept low-key hitting on me. She then tells me he asked to sleep with her, and he wanted to ask her if I was down. I laughed it off and said, you're crazy. And after a while of silence, I deflected and heard some noise that was in the darkness. You hear that? After a little bit of small talk between him and Kay, he then learned that neither one of us was interested, that what we were doing was just hanging out. This then turns the mood and you can feel it. It became eerily quiet. He became reserved and had shifty eyes. I sat down for a while just to please Kay. At one point, I turned to Joey, knowing he walked here and it was dark by now, and I asked him, What are you about to do? Because I'm going to go home and Kay's coming with me. He said, I just texted my boy. He's about to come get me. When he was texting, Kay stood behind him and caught a glimpse of the message. Her eyes grew wide, and she looked at me. That was silent code for, 
bitch. What the fuck? Kay broke the silence and said, Hey, come help me get this thing from inside to bring it out. So I did. We went inside, and she said she was going to call her uncle so he could take us to my place. I questioned why. My house was about ten minutes away. She said that when she saw Joey text, he sent whoever was coming to pick him up the information of all of us here. He noted that her aunts were high on coke and that we were high and our age. He was telling his boy to come over to basically rob and assault us. He called dips on the blonde one. I was the blonde one. Every hair stood up on my body with the thought of some gross goon trying to have his way with me. I was mad because she got me into this shit. We came back out and continued our conversation with him so he wouldn't get suspicious. She mentions out loud that her uncle was on his way home. As her uncle pulls in, a sigh of relief comes over me. They speak briefly and Joey then departs into the darkness before his ride even shows up. Kay and I get a ride from her uncle to my house. On the ride, we noted how weird Joey was. Later that night, as I was going to bed, I check my Facebook and I have a friend request from Joey and a message. You're so pretty. I would love some alone time with you without your friend. The message ended with his number. I never blocked someone so fast. After this, Kay didn't learn her lesson, but that's a story for another time. A week later, Joey was in the news. He was wanted for sexual assault, robbery, and drug possession. A bullet well missed on my part. Joey Crack. Let's never meet again. I recently bought my first home, but being on a budget, we had to settle for an older home. It was built around 1951, and the whole neighborhood was built around the same time frame. During the home buying process, we worked virtually with our real estate agent, as we were in an entirely different state. Come move in time, I could tell that the house had an energy about it. Nothing necessarily malicious, just a sort of change in the air that comes with a house 72 years old. As we begin to explore, we find an odd stuffed toy rabbit in the attic. My wife and I are both superstitious, so we decide to leave the rabbit where it is and not touch it. Come several months, I begin thinking more and more about the rabbit for reasons unknown to me. Suddenly, a name pops into my head. Chester. Chester McDonald. I think, this is weird, and I tell my wife. She thinks nothing of it, just that it's a bit strange, and jokes that they probably died on the property. I do a quick Google search, and find a younger-looking man with the same name who lives in the same city, but think nothing of it. Why would I contact them just because of their name? Anyways... Fast forward to a day ago, and my wife tells me that while I'm at work, an older man approached her while she was washing her car. She's friendly to him and says hi, but is in no mood to talk. She resumes washing our car, but after a minute or so, realizes he is still there. So, she starts chatting with him. Turns out, he grew up in this house. So, he tells my wife all about it and about how great it was to live in the house. She takes him to the backyard, and he tells us all about it. Everything from the fact that his dad built the shed we have in the corner of our yard to a little stone path I recently found and began excavating. And my wife is thanking him for his visit. She asks him what his name is. The next thing she told me sent shivers down my spine. His name is Chester McDonald. I have no idea why I would have this man's name pop into my head, and I'm honestly pretty freaked out about it. It wouldn't be the first time I've heard someone's name before. It probably doesn't mean much, but I just thought I would share it.
So I'm a broke college student, and I thought I could start a handyman business and make some money while I'm at college. I posted an ad on Craigslist advertising my skills, construction-related skills. Anyhow, a guy wanted me to fix his cash register and stereo. I drive over there and fix the cash register. It turned out to be a loose spring. And while I'm there, he wants me to help him rewind his VHS tape. Quote, I can't see the rewind button. I push the rewind button, and it's this guy-on-guy -guy vintage adult tape. Anyhow, I figured it was just an accident, and I chatted for a few minutes with him. I said I would take the stereo home and see if I could fix it, but I got paid for the cash register and left. When I got home, I checked my email and found this. Hope you weren't insulted by the VHS film I turned on. I had forgotten I'd even had it, as I threw my whole library from our video store away. I really get turned on by large stuff like that. Anyway, feel free to come over any time. I think I can make it worth your while. And soon after, another email followed saying this. I am really anxious to see you again. Whenever you want to come over, late afternoons or around this time are always good discreet and forty dollars for maybe twenty minutes or so and then i received another email i would really like to do stuff with you i don't need reciprocation you won't be sorry i am drug and disease free and when i didn't respond he sent another one saying interested at this point i wasn't sure what to respond with like I've got to return the stereo too. I am not going to fix it. But I am so glad I used my Google voice number. But I'm very sorry that I told him where I lived when I introduced myself. I decided to park my car far away from my dorm. My girlfriend thought it was funny and said, Now you know why I don't like going outside at night. So I drove over to his house in the early hours of the morning and dropped off the stereo and sprinted back to my car and hightailed it out of there. I then responded after I left with this. Hi, my bad. I wasn't aware of what you were getting at with your previous question. However, I'm going to stick with the services I posted in the ad. I returned the radio to your garage. I left it in a bag so it wouldn't get damaged by the rain and I don't wish to do any further business with you. Best of luck to you, Dan. I live in Hollywood, California, which has become a bit of a shit show in the last year. There's a small liquor store, two apartments down from mine, I walk my dog when I get off of work and typically stop by the liquor store because the owner bakes my dog treats. While my dog and I were at the counter talking to the owner, a normal looking 20 something year old girl comes into the store. She walks around the aisles for a bit and approaches me and my dog at the counter. She pets my dog, comments on how cute he is. I say, thanks, and then I leave the store. A little while later, she walks out and calls to me as I'm walking home. I turn around and acknowledge her, and she approaches my dog and I. She starts petting him. I'm mostly just trying to get his walk over and being polite. I only have to walk two apartments down back to my place. I start pulling my dog's leash and walk away from her. She follows me. She begins to ask some really bizarre questions. Do you live nearby? How long have you lived here? How much is your rent? I politely tell her that I live in an apartment very close, and I point to the building. It's not really a big deal because it is gated, and I live all the way in the back of the apartment complex. I didn't point to my actual door. She then says, Oh, I know that building. A friend of mine used to live there. I oblige telling her that's a cool coincidence with a hint of sarcasm. 
My dog and I are now standing in front of the gate to my building. I know better than to open the gate and go inside because she is literally still trying to make conversation with me. I tell her, I have to go. She then tells me that she would love to see my apartment to see if it's the same one her friend used to live in. I say, no, I'm just getting off of work and don't want company. She changes her story and tells me that she really needs to use the bathroom. Before I get the chance to tell her no, she goes on and on about how badly she needs to pee and begs me to let her in my apartment to use the bathroom. Nice try. I make up a story about how my dog had shit all over the apartment while I was at work and that I needed to clean it up. She says, oh, I don't mind. I tell her, I mind and that I cannot let her use my bathroom. I thought about opening my gate and going inside, but at this point, I had a feeling she'd follow me through the gate. I stayed put in front of the gate and repeated that there was dog shit all over my apartment and I wasn't letting her in. To get rid of her, I told her to go back to the liquor store and ask the owner if she could use the bathroom. She then told me that she has already and they said they didn't have one. I then said, sorry, I've got to go. She walked off and I stayed put until she was out of my sight. She began walking in the direction of the liquor store. When I couldn't see her, I walked my dog through the gate and into my apartment. I double bolted the doors. A short time later, I was meeting a friend at a bar around the corner. I decided to stop at the liquor store to ask the owner if the girl had gone in there to use the bathroom. I was just curious and suspicious. I entered the liquor store and asked about the girl. The owner said, Are you talking about the girl that was in here when you were in here earlier? I said, Yeah, the girl that was petting my dog. The owner then confirmed my suspicions. The owner told me that shortly after I had left the liquor store, the girl walked out in my direction. I told the owner my end of the story. The owner then told me the girl had walked back to the liquor store a short time later and approached two males who were sitting in their work van in the liquor store parking lot. After talking to the men for a short time, she walked off. The men then came into the liquor store and told the owner that the girl had told them that she would go down on one of them if they got her high. They declined, and so she walked off. I asked the owner if she ever asked about using the bathroom, and the owner said, no. That confirmed my suspicions. This girl most likely wanted to come into my apartment to rob me to buy drugs. Needless to say, my year lease is up next month, and I am leaving Hollywood. Last year I moved into another city after finishing high school. I assessed several college options and decided on one that would have me move roughly three hours. I found an apartment where I would be able to live without roommates and that was in a safe part of town with reasonable rent. It was close to some attractions in the city, which was an added bonus to me as it would still allow me to have a reasonable social life. For the first four months or so, it was great. There were absolutely no problems or safety concerns of any sort, and I managed to become good friends with a guy who studied at the same college as me. He coincidentally lived five minutes away from me, so we would often hang out at each other's places. One night, just as winter started, he called me over to play video games and hang out. We had a pretty chill night, drank a few beers, had a good few laughs, and enjoyed ourselves. At around 1am, we decided to call it a wrap, and I headed home to my apartment. When I got back home, I decided to head out to the balcony that overlooked the entrance of my building to smoke a cigarette. I vividly remember looking around and seeing absolutely nobody. It was a cold winter night, and it wasn't the weekend, so understandably everybody was at home. 
Besides the usual car or two passing by, it was dead quiet. Once I finished my cigarette, I decided to call it a night and got ready for bed. I was understandably confused when I heard a short ring on my doorbell. I stood in the center of my room for a solid few seconds as confusion and a little bit of fear set in. I snapped out of it and decided to tiptoe to my door and to just try and hear if anyone was outside. My immediate thought was that my friend came over to drop something off that I might have forgotten, but I thought to myself that he would have texted or called me. I probably listened for half a minute or so when the person once again rang the doorbell and then softly knocked a few times. I was stood still and didn't want to make a sound so that I wouldn't give away the fact that I was at the door. I heard the stranger pacing around the apartment for a few seconds before he stopped. I waited for any sort of noise, but it was quiet. That was when I had decided to look through the peephole to see that he had hopefully left. I picked up the cover of the peephole and took a look. My legs pretty much went numb as I saw a hooded figure looking straight into the peephole. He was holding the zipper of his hoodie so as to cover his face. All I could really make out was his forehead and eyes. He must have either heard me lift the cover or my heavy breathing, because right away he moved from the peephole and said, I know you're at the door. By this point, I was pretty much shivering in fear, but mustered up the courage to say, I'm calling the cops, man. He laughed and said, Sure thing, big guy. He proceeded to wipe away the door handle with his sleeve before walking off. I understandably called the police. When they came over, they informed me that I wasn't the only one. He had been doing this for at least a month, and they suspected him of at least one home invasion where a father chased him out of the house. I crashed at my friend's house for a week or so after this before going back into my apartment. It's been a year, and I haven't heard any news about him. He could have been arrested by now, but as far as I know, he hasn't been. I find it more likely that he simply moved to a different area. I'm not sure if he had any violent intent or not, but either way, let's seriously not meet again. This is nowhere near as creepy as some of the other stuff I've read, but it's still very strange, and I have no idea. My friend D and I, both 17, are cruising around our local area in his new car. It's important to note that D had not passed his test, nor had the insurance. Therefore, we usually drove around at 2 to 3 in the morning. We pull up to our local petrol station to get some cigarettes. I had a goatee and didn't get ID'd, so we came here fairly often. As we pull in, this fairly built guy asks us to roll down our window. We roll down our window and get chatting to him. He tells us that his wife is very angry at him because he's on a bender and can't get home, that he's desperate for a lift back. He then offers us 500 pounds for a lift to a city that's only 40 to 50 minutes away. I'd be lying if I didn't say that our dumb 17-year-old brains immediately thought this was an easy payday. Then the reality set in that we were driving illegally, but we didn't want to tell him that, so we politely declined his offer. He then gets really, really insistent that we have to give him a lift, really insistent. I finally realize that surely he can just get a taxi. The guy working in the garage would definitely call him one, and it's not like he's short on cash, nor would the taxi even break 100 pounds. So I say this to him, and he genuinely has no answer to it, and just insists we give him a lift. I offer to book him a cash taxi, and after many attempts of convincing him on how much cheaper it is, he accepts. We say we're leaving now, as we were both weirded out, and he just turns to us and says, You guys are fucking idiots. We just kind of smile and then start driving. 
Out of nowhere, a guy with an even bigger build runs at our car and just throws his drink all over D through the open window. Obviously D is fuming and jumps out of the car and I follow. We walk up and the guy that was talking to us is profusely apologizing for his friend's actions. I remind D that we're driving illegally and the last thing we want is to get into a fight and have the police called. So we get back into the car and drive off. We also cancel his taxi. The rest of the night, we were just trying to make sense of what had just happened. It never sat right with me. I don't know why he was so insistent. Maybe when we took him to his destination, he would just jump out and wouldn't pay, so he would get the ride for him and his friend free. It could have been to rob the car, but then knocking out two fully grown lats for a beat up car just seems like a lot of effort. I've always been genuinely curious as to what would have happened if we accepted, and how bad of a situation it could have been. Friday night, my friend and I stopped at my regular gas station to pick something up. I pulled up and left her in my passenger seat with the car running and asked her to lock the doors. When I came back out, I went to open my car door, and she let me in before telling me that less than a minute before I walked out, a man came out of the gas station. My driver's side was facing away from the gas station, and he walked up behind the car, between the gas pump and my side, and he tried to open the back driver's side door. When it didn't open, he kept walking, made eye contact with my friend, and then went and got into the passenger seat of a truck parked nearby. As he was getting into the truck, she saw me walk out. It's worth mentioning that the city I live in is the top sex trafficking city in our state, and our state is the ninth largest sex trafficking state in the USA. At this point, I'm already pulling out of the gas station and getting the hell away from these people. When I stop to turn right out of the gas station, my friend yells at me, Holy shit, they're following us. They're fucking following us. I'm not having this, so I whip a right turn and head for the highway connection. They're still behind us, so I end up pulling some fast and furious type driving to put as much distance and vehicles between us and them as possible while telling my friend to find the nearest police station. When she puts my phone up on the stand in front of me, I look at where we're going and decide to take a longer way that doesn't make sense to take if you're going to the area we're about to go to. Well, they continue to follow us. Finally, we merge onto the highway and get some vehicles in between us, but they're driving recklessly to keep up behind us. Finally, I cut in front of a line of speeding cars and we lose them until we get to the police station. We ended up sitting there for a while, digesting what happened before checking the exterior of my car for anything they may have put on it. We then take another roundabout way to go back to my house, where we'll pass the gas station again, but where it gives us enough time to notice if they followed us again. As we pass the gas station, we see that the truck is parked in the parking lot of the shopping center behind the gas station, facing the road that we'd taken the last time we pulled out. I ended up going to a church near my house to avoid going home. We called 911 and then filled the operator in on everything. Since then, we've heard nothing back, and I've been anxious every time I leave my house, especially after dark. It's almost like I have this weird feeling that I'm being watched, even though I know it's in my head. No thank you. My mom was born and raised in the high country of East Central Montana. She came from ranching people and her father, my grandfather, was a genuine cowboy. She often did work around the ranch with him, so not much shakes her to her soul. 
except for what happened when she had to run into town when I was only eight months old. This happened in the middle of a sunny summer day. The ranch she was raised on was almost two hours away from the nearest town. You had to drive north on a highway for 30 minutes, then you had to drive on a dirt road for another 45 minutes across the Montana high country to get to the ranch where she was raised. I'm emphasizing this because it not only shows how far out into the bumfuck nowhere she lived at the time, but it plays into why this story becomes so disturbing. My mom had to run into town to get groceries and baby supplies for me. She was driving on the long and isolated dirt road back to the ranch when she reaches into her purse on the passenger seat to get something. It slips out of her hand and into the passenger footwell. Fair enough. She then has to stop the car so she can safely retrieve what she dropped. She grabs it, and as soon as she sits back up, she looks into the rearview mirror and sees a man about a hundred feet behind the car, running at her. Needless to say, she puts the car back into gear and gets the hell out of there. As she's looking back at me in the car seat, making sure that I'm okay, she sees the guy give up running after her and run back into the ditch to hide. Of course, when she gets home she tells her parents about what had happened, and they are stunned. Here's where it gets disturbing at least psychologically. My mom didn't see any cars or trucks parked along that dirt road for the entire way to the ranch. She also didn't see any people walking along the highway or the dirt road, which raises even more questions. How did he get out there? Why was he out there? And even more disturbing, what would he have done to my mom or an eight-month-old me? The more I thought about it, the more disturbing it became, was a quote from my mom. I've only asked my mom about this story twice. After the second time, she tells me to never ask her about it again, and I completely understand why. I get messed up thinking about it. I can only imagine how she felt having directly experienced it. This happened when I was quite young, maybe around the age of 7 up until the age of 13. But essentially, I'd regularly hear footsteps running back and forth and down the hallway at certain times during the night. It was unnerving, but I didn't feel threatened by it, if that makes sense. I'd gotten used to it, but then something changed, where if I was sitting in the living room alone, there would be footsteps again, this time much slower and I'd feel something watching me from the door frame. I'd look back over the sofa, and I knew something was there. It felt like something was checking on me. Again, not that I felt scared. It felt comforting weirdly enough, but it went on for a good few years whenever I was alone in the living room chilling. Another example, too, was when I was around the age of 15. It was the middle of June, and I had my nightlight on, I think it was around 10 p.m. My bed was in the middle of the room, just a bit away from my bedroom door, and my room was always left a little ajar with the hallway light still on. And initially, I thought I had sleep paralysis, but I could still move, and I heard something whispering loudly right next to my ear, and it was saying my name repeatedly, and it didn't stop. It felt like it was pressed right up against my left ear, saying it in this deep voice. I was genuinely terrified because I didn't know what the hell it was. I remember covering my ears, but it got so loud I started screaming hysterically for my mom. I had never been in so much fear like that since then, and that continued for the next two years, initially in my bedroom and then around the house and I'd lock myself in the bathroom waiting for my mom to come back from work because I could hear it in other rooms. I'd put earphones in and it would muffle it somewhat and then eventually outside of the house to some capacity. It became like a mumbling and less like my name over time. 
I did have bad mental health at the time, and it was eventually put down to auditory hallucinations and visual ones too, because I kept seeing blurs of black darting across the house back then. But honestly, although I felt comfort knowing it was in my head, to this day, I still question what the hell that was. I like to think of it now as tuning in and out of a radio. That's how I've dealt with it since, and it's made things so much easier. I know rationally it's not actually there, and I can make a choice whether to engage with it sort of thing. And sometimes it is easier than other times. It can still catch me off guard, I just have to go with it. What also helped, weirdly enough, was watching Ghost Hunters at the time, and I gradually got less scared hearing those things. There is a history of severe suicidal tendencies on my mother's side, along with mental illnesses such as bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, and PTSD, and my late grandmother died from dementia, and my mother is currently suffering from onset dementia too, so this might be a sign at the age of 21 that I'm on my way to popping my clogs off. I was 29. I was having chest pains. They were reminiscent of when I was younger. I rushed to the hospital just for it to be heartburn. I started treatment for that, but it got to a point where I couldn't move. I was sent home from work and went to my doctor. I described everything and said it just felt like bad heartburn. The doctor starts looking at stuff and treating me for GERDs. Just as she's about to send me on my way, she says she wants to do an EKG. After the results, she brought in a more experienced doctor, who agreed with her and said that they want to keep me overnight for observation. I get to the hospital and they hook me up with a ton of devices. There are multiple tests and they start medicating me. All they told me before I fell asleep from the meds was I had an enlarged and weakened left ventricle. It's now maybe 3 a.m., I'm awoken to the creepiest looking doctor ever. He had this skeleton thin body, but with a round pot belly. Think Farnsworth from Futurama. He was bald, but with this greasy stringy hair that was like long, and he draped a few over his head. Meanwhile, I'm still drugged out and afraid of what's going on. He pulls up a chair and asks if I know what's going on. He says I had a nibble of a heart attack using his pointer finger and thumb to indicate very small. He explains something about numbers, and if they hit a certain number, it indicates a heart attack, and mine hit the number directly next to it. So let's say 10 means a heart attack. I hit a 9. Bear in mind, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 39. I'm laying there freaked out. Everyone I know is asleep, so I have no one to talk to. I'm too drugged out to do anything. I just pushed the button for more drugs to go back to sleep. They did a heart catheter and said my arteries were clean. Months later, I found I had a flu-like virus that went untreated. It reached my heart before my body fought it off. I'd gone to a MedExpress place a month before because I was sick with flu-like symptoms, but they lasted two weeks. The doctor said, it's the flu. You're young, you'll get over it. And he never did any tests. I had to wear a heart defibrillator for about four months after that, and I'm on heart medication for the rest of my life. All because the express doc was too lazy to test anything. But that night shift doctor looked like death, and I thought he was coming to tell me that I died. I was in a smallish fishing boat charter that sank a little less than 12 miles from a Caribbean island in the Atlantic. From the first sign of trouble to looking straight down at the boat slowly sinking beneath the surface was only about 10 minutes time. Trust me when I say that's an image I'll never forget. A white sport fisher being swallowed by the dark blue beneath me. 
When boats sink, they sink. Somewhere in the chaos, the captain called his friends in the marina before the boat sank, so we waited there, just drifting for a while, collecting any floating debris we could hang on to. Fortunately, we had life vests on, otherwise I'd have no doubt we'd all be dead. Two hours pass. Nobody comes by to pick us up. Clouds and rain are more frequent, so we lose sight of the island occasionally, and I finally convince everyone to agree to start swimming towards the island. I know the best thing to do is stay together and not move, but the island didn't seem too far away, and it was obvious to me that nobody was going to find us at this point. Just as we start slowly moving, a helicopter comes and hovers somewhere between us and the island, presumably over the coordinates the captain gave his friends. I swim my ass off towards that thing, and in doing so, lose sight of the captain and first mate. So now it's just me and my sister, and then the helicopter leaves. That sucked. But, given the weather, there was almost zero chance of them spotting us unless we were right under them. We decide our best chance at survival is to keep swimming towards the island. The whole time it's rainy, cloudy, rough seas, and much of the time we can't see the island at all, and we use the wind as our directional guide. That sensation of not being able to see anything but grey skies and waves, with nothing to grasp onto, was the toughest part. We did see another helicopter before nightfall when the weather started clearing a bit, but it was way too far away from us. Nightfall is also when we can tell that we actually made progress and were getting closer to the island, but the darkness changes all that, as all we could look at were a handful of lights on the island and a bright spot that it was probably a resort, seven or so miles to the north. Fast forward to maybe two or three a.m., some 15 to 16 hours after the boat sank, and we actually get to the island. Of course, it's mostly cliffs. The water is colder, so we swim south until we can see water that isn't white. We get out of the water maybe an hour later and can barely walk. There are some lights in the distance, but no way we were going to get to them in our condition, so we just try to stay warm under some trees out of the rain. No sleep just shivering and trying to stay warm. Finally, the sun comes up and we're able to stop shivering. We can walk somewhat better now, so we start drinking from a nearby stream, assuming we'll be able to get help before we die from some parasite, and start hiking over the hills. I tossed my life vest into a tree just in case someone spots it. The hike takes us a few hours over two ridges and through some pretty thick brush, Fortunately, there were a few more streams. We finally get to a makeshift farm of sorts and decide to eat some bananas from a small banana grove. That's when we spot a guy walking to work on the farm. He feeds us some crackers and water and walks up the road to call the police for us. Based on where we got to land, they changed their search and found the captain and first mate in the water shortly thereafter. We all end up in hospital around the same time and we finally got to escape the hospital after 36 hours and several bags of IV fluids. There's a lot more that happened in that whole 72 hour period, but you get the idea. Funny thing, we went back about 8 months later and tried to get a boat to take us out to where we got to land, but they said it was too dangerous. It was all over the news for like 2.6 minutes, like everything these days. Even though we all survived, I still have PTS from that event, which sucks. It's pretty well triggered when I'm on the water and it's stormy, or in planes and it's turbulent, but PTSD be damned. I'm planning on buying a sailboat by the end of the year and sailing around the Caribbean and Central America, and if I can't get enough blue water experience, maybe across the Pacific, we'll see. This experience takes place a few years ago, and it involves my former friend, Kene, and her former lover. Hey, since it's Valentine's Day, why not, huh? Her boyfriend was a good-looking guy, 
He had a really good job in a big company, but the problem was, he was married with two kids. In other words, she was having an affair, but she was really happy with it. I guess that she felt it was all fine. It was kind of awful, but she was sure she could steal him away from his family, or at least extort him for money. She hatched a plan. She wanted to engineer a situation where he broke up with his wife and left his family. Therefore, his adultery would remain a secret and he wouldn't have to pay any alimony payments if they got divorced. You probably can understand why at this point I want to remind you that she's a former friend of mine. She was pretty open about the whole thing and I think she held nothing back. She even showed me his wife online. She found her profile on Facebook or Instagram, I forget. She would constantly bring up his wife's profile on her phone whenever she saw me to seemingly mock her and attempt to belittle her. Whenever I saw her photos, I would not join in on the bashing. To me, she just looked like a bright and beautiful woman. Maybe she put her down to make herself feel better. Kane was too much. I was overwhelmed by her daily updates and the spewing of her bare desires. I would have tried harder to distance myself from her if she wasn't literally working in a building on the same street I was living in. She was running her own business, and I walked past her store every day to use the subway, so she was unavoidable. One day, I was in the food court of the mall in our town with my daughter, and I noticed that my friend's boyfriend and his family walk in. I knew them both instantly because of the way Kane had been so eager to show me photos of them. They looked like a really nice family, like the kind you would see on cereal boxes in days gone by. Everyone was smiling and enjoying their meals. It was awful being in the know. Their father looked so nice and in love with his family. What a shame he was messing them around. I was thinking all of this while feeding my daughter her food. She knocked her soft toy off at the edge of the table. I stooped to pick it up as quickly as I could, but a hand lay on the toy before my hand could reach it. Without meeting eyes of the owner of that hand, I called out, Oh, thank you. I rose up to my seated position, and I saw a smiling face with an outstretched arm offering me the toy. She was beautiful and bright looking. I knew that face. It was his wife, the woman I'd seen in the photos online. My friend was having an affair with her husband, and she was right here in front of me. I suddenly felt a sharp internal pain in my chest, the pang of knowing more than I should, of secondhand guilt or embarrassment perhaps. I pretended to be calm and reached out for my daughter's toy and thanked the woman. The woman replied with nada, you're welcome, but in a low and deliberate tone she warned, tell Kene to watch out. I felt my blood run cold. How did she know? I was at a loss for words. She placed the stuffed toy in my hand, but I felt as if something else dropped onto my palm. She smiled and turned back to her table. Their family went on laughing and enjoying their day. Meanwhile, my palms were sweating and my heart was palpitating. I placed the stuffed toy on the table and fearfully looked at what had been dropped in my palm. I saw a few neatly folded pieces of paper. I was freaked out, but also incredibly curious. I needed to know, so I quickly opened them up. Written in small print was Kane's address, phone number, educational background, work history, family names with their occupations and ages, phone numbers, and addresses. There also was a list of Kane's friends, and it had all of their personal information. I started to shake when I saw my name, my phone number, my family members' names, and my address. Well, it was the first time in my life when I heard my heart beat like that. I didn't tell Kane about what happened. I was furious. She was bad news. I found out a little later that she sent my husband a couple of inappropriate messages too, so I was justified to get rid of her. It seems like Kane and her affair was shut down pretty quick. 
She let me know that in one of the meetings I had with her. He apparently was furious with the way she spoke about his wife. Huh. Not long after this all went down, I moved away, and of course, I didn't bother telling Kane where I'd moved to. I also blocked all incoming phone calls from her number. She was just bad news. That was a really scary experience in the food court. I still have the piece of paper she handed to me. This is the most terrifying experience I've ever had. It traumatized me. When I was single, my friend was adamant on setting me up on dates. She was so overly content with her boyfriend, she had it in her mind that I needed one as well. She said that her boyfriend's friend was a good-looking single guy who didn't have many friends or acquaintances since he moved to the area, and she wanted to introduce me to him. He was a medical student from the next prefecture over. Well, it took a little convincing, but I decided to take the plunge and meet the guy, on the provision that it would be all four of us and I wouldn't have to meet him alone. The first time we met up was only brief, I'm talking like 30 minutes tops. I think that my friend had organized that because she knew how nervous I was about the whole thing. Well. The rushed double date went pretty well, I have to say. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would have been, so I exchanged numbers with him. We texted back and forth for a while, and then arranged a second date. He wanted to take me on a night drive and get some dinner. That struck me as a little unusual. But hey, we were both students, so it made sense. We weren't made of money. He arrived in a really nice car, so my theory about keeping the date cheap went out the window. He said that his parents bought it for him. They wanted him to have the right kind of look. That's interesting, I thought to myself. I looked over the car to check out the interior, and I looked to the back seats, and I noticed something. There was some rope just sat there on the back seat. We then pull away. As we were driving, I thought to myself, there must be a good reason for that. But another part of my mind said to me, what's a medical student need a rope for? He knew we were on a date tonight. Why would he have that back there? I started to get a little nervous. The conversation in the car had kind of died. It was becoming boring and awkward. The silences in between weren't pleasant. I pulled down the passenger's sun visor to look in the mirror because I felt as if I was sweating. I didn't want to show this guy that I was going red if he'd done nothing wrong. I mean at this point, it was just a rope in the car. I tried to think of other things, but I couldn't hide my discomfort. We were supposed to go to this observatory area in the mountains to look at the stars. It sounded great at the time, but all I could see were miles and miles of forest, separated by the open road. We were going somewhere very discreet, it seemed. I kept being nice and gave the guy the benefit of the doubt. After a short while, we arrived at the observation deck. There we were, out in the darkness of nature, alone. Well, it seemed like all the insects in the world were out chirping. It was better than the awkward silences. I was looking up at the stars when my date said the following words. Which do you prefer? I leave you here alone and drive away, or you have sex with me later. Naturally, I was shocked and stunned. I looked into his eyes because I thought and prayed that it might just be a really bad joke, but his demeanor told me that he wasn't kidding. He stood there, arrogantly waiting for a serious answer. I did my best to deceive him. I needed a ride out of there. I made promises that I knew I could never bring myself to deliver. I don't want to talk about that bit, to be honest. But all I can tell you is he was really happy he forced me to answer that. It was a power thing. When we got to the restaurant parking lot, I made some excuse to go down to the convenience store. 
I then made out that I was sick, and I went into some detail, which I knew would put him off what he had made me say I'd do with him later. I made it home and called my friend. I told her everything and told her to tell her boyfriend to tell that guy to not contact me again. Luckily, in later life, I was blessed with meeting a great guy who I ended up marrying. I can't help but feel that I had a close call all those years ago. This happened about five years ago when I was 26. Back in those days, I used to go to a local pub restaurant by myself. I used to enjoy sitting in my favorite seat, and I loved the menu. I didn't care about what others would think to see me sat there alone. I was happy by myself. One day, I was at my usual table drinking, and this guy comes up and starts talking to me. He looked to be about 45 years old at first glance. He was old enough to be my dad. He said that he saw me there often and was also there by himself. We got to talking and it turned out he was a really nice guy. He had similar hobbies to mine. He came from a place really close to my hometown and I was really surprised when he guessed my profession. When I asked how he was able to do it, he said, I don't know, I guess I'm psychic. This was a little strange because my profession isn't an obvious one. Now that I think back to it, it was more than a little strange that he guessed it. We hit it off and we would drink together. It was really great to have a friend. Quite soon into our friendship, he asked me to show him my hometown. I was really confused by this. Why would a complete stranger want to see my hometown? It wasn't like he mentioned it once or twice in passing. He mentioned my hometown every time we met up. When I asked him why he wanted to go there so bad, he replied, I just want to see what kind of place it is. I want you to show me around. Since it had been about a year and a half since I'd seen my family, I was giving visiting my hometown some serious consideration. There was another reason I was eager to see my family. My sister had recently told me she'd been stalked by some guy. She had recently been asking me for some advice on how to deal with it. It was really traumatic since she was only a high school student at the time. My sister was cute, but I never dreamed that she would have any troubles like this. I'll never forget it. She used the word persistent, a word which seems unnatural, and it made me feel almost mournful for her. His method of stalking was online. He blanketed all of her socials. No matter how many times she blocked the guy, he made new profiles. He always found a way to harass her. I won't go into the content of his harassment. I remember when I saw her in person, her lively, cheerful smile had been reduced to an anxious, ponderous frown. She said that the stalker had backed off a little in the past few days. I was hoping the guy would quit entirely. He made my blood boil, but my blood soon turned ice cold when I asked her if any of the stalker profiles had a profile picture. She held up her smartphone and revealed an image of her stalker. I was looking at the guy I met in my favorite restaurant. There was no mistaking it. Just by the mole on his face, I knew it was him. I had to hide my shock. This guy had already traumatized her. I wouldn't let him hold any more power over her. Immediately, I ask myself internally, is this some sick coincidence? I live so far from my sister, there's no way that he would know how to find me. Surely not. I had to protect my sister. This ends now, I thought, as I lied to her and said, I haven't seen that guy, but look, his location... It's kind of near me, and I know that restaurant he's uploaded a photo of there. I will keep an eye out for him, sis, and if I find him, he will wish that I hadn't. She smiled softly, but I could tell that she didn't hold out much hope. I guess her look told me, thanks for the gesture. So I went back to where I was currently living, and I asked to meet up again with my sister's stalker, aka my friend from the bar. This time I asked him to meet me somewhere a bit more secluded. 
we agreed to meet by a river in the area, under the premise of watching the starry night sky. Romantic, right? The night of the date arrives. I lie in wait with a plan, and as soon as I see his car pull up to the spot, I walk over to him. He waves hello and ambles towards me. I grab him by the neck. I wanted him to experience some fear. He is completely powerless. I guess he hasn't been in this position before. When I confront him, he breaks almost instantly. He tells me everything. He said that he saw my sister's pictures online, and he said that he fell in love with her at first sight. Bear in mind, this guy is 45. I guess you could say that I was stupid to confront him in a secluded location, but when you're in that situation, you just want to put things right. Thankfully it worked, but it could have gone very, very wrong. I made him promise not to bother her again. He did. He was very obliging since I had my hand on his throat. I was convinced he would leave her alone. I called my sister. I didn't give any of the details away, but I told her that I had solved her little problem. She sounded relieved, and honestly, that was a massive weight off of my shoulders. After all of this, the thing that scared me the most wasn't the stalker, but social media. How he was able to find me and my sister is nothing short of disturbing. I haven't been to my favorite pub since, and please take care online. I once matched with someone on a dating app, and it completely put me off ever using apps like that again. At first, we got on quite well, enough for us to have a date, but something about him and I just didn't feel like a great fit, unfortunately. The reason why I didn't think that we would ever become an item was because he came across as a pretty weird dude. He was a little bit intense, you know. A bit stocky. Full on. Unfortunately, he already had my information, so I would sometimes hear from him and keep in touch with him via an app called Line. I felt that if I blocked him, something bad might happen. He might fly off the handle. This guy had the intensity that was just haunting. I didn't want to provoke him. I know that sounds so dumb, but that was how I felt. Eventually, I stopped opening his messages. I just left them unread. After a while, he got the picture and stopped contacting me. And I know it's not nice to give someone the cold shoulder like that, but he left me no other choice. If ever I did reply, he would pounce on it and bombard me with messages at all hours of the day and night. He stopped messaging me, and I thought that would be the end of things. I assumed he'd given up and moved on. However, one day during a particularly cold winter in my city, something bad happened. It was freezing as I walked home from work. I didn't think that I could feel any colder. But when someone jumped out in front of me from some darkened alley, my heart felt like it had turned to ice. It was him, the guy I went on a date with two months ago. So there I was, confronted by the creep I thought I had successfully avoided. I was really scared. He just stood in my path and didn't say anything. He was glaring at me, but I was shocked into a silence. I didn't know what to say at first. After a couple of awkward seconds, I asked him what he was doing there. He said something like this. What's so bad about two lovers meeting? I mean it's only natural that I come round to see how you are if I can't reach you on the phone, right? What he said made no sense. It had been a good few months since we had last spoken, and even longer since we had our one and only date. It made no sense at all. I thought that he was obviously crazy, and then I thought about getting as far away from him as humanly possible. So fight or flight kicked in and I just ran. 
All I wanted to do was go home and forget about the weird encounter with that guy, but I realized that if he had met me on my route home, then there was every chance that he might know where I lived. I realized that it would have been totally dumb to go straight home, so I stood there as it snowed, cowering in some disused building's archway, frantically thinking about what to do next. After the adrenaline subsided, the solution was obvious. I needed to go to the police. I went to the local police station. After I made my report, the officers told me that they would patrol my area just to be on the safe side. I felt reassured, but not exactly safe. And to be honest, I turned into a bit of a recluse for a while there. I developed an acute fear of leaving the house. Three months or so went by, and there was no sign of that one-date wonder I matched with online. So slowly but surely, my confidence came back to me. I went outside by myself for the first time in a long time. I was relying on the help of my friends and family up until then. I planned on heading to the supermarket. I knew the route, and it was close. The police station was nearby, and I felt it was a relatively safe route. No word of a lie. I got about 20 paces up my street, and then I heard a voice call out to me from across the street. I was addressed by my name. It wasn't an oi or a cat call or anything. This person knew me. This is roughly what the guy shouted at me. Hey, Kana, I've been waiting for you. He crossed the road with a light jog and stood a couple of paces behind me with a completely straight poker face. Hey, you know you didn't need to call the cops on me, right? Don't you think that was a little mean, sweetheart? I was so scared that I couldn't make a sound. I knew I had to run, and I'm so happy that I chose the route I did to venture out for the first time, as I knew exactly how to get to the police station. I ran there and reported what happened. I have to say... Life so far has been pretty incident-free since that second reporting, but that was how it was before. I feel as if I have been lulled into a false sense of security. I feel like it might be the calm before the storm. Winter is rolling around again, and the nights are getting darker. When the snow begins to fall, I'm scared all those memories of being stalked will return to me again. This happened about 10 years ago. Back then, I was really into dating websites, before the app days, before any kind of safety was in place. I would do quite well on these sites. I matched with people who were using the dating sites for the same reason I was. If you get me, we were looking for the same thing. I liked life. I was riding on my own confidence, daring myself to go bigger and bigger with these wild meetups. I was surprised one day to get matched with a 19-year-old. Her first message said, Give me your email address. I was fine with the direct approach, so I sent it straight over to her. You sound fun. I want to hang out with you. I couldn't believe my luck. I smirked and said to myself, You can do that today if you want, honey. I'm in good shape. I decided to reply with, Sounds great but why don't we exchange photos before we meet? I sent the best photo of myself I could, slightly fraudulent as it was a couple of years old, but hey, I bet I wasn't the only one on that site to do that. Shortly after, I received a photo back. She was hot. I punched the air. Life was sweet. She had a pretty sweet tan and a cute pouty look on her face. I was into it. Home run. We were both really into meeting up, so we set up a date. Things moved quickly. She would send emails like, I don't want to go very far, I only have a moped. And, ah, it would be sweet if you drove to come get me. This was kind of annoying, as I wanted to avoid driving so I could drink. But since she was pretty hot, I guess I could just get loaded when I got home later. I decided I'd take her out to karaoke and dinner. And then, if there was a chance, drive somewhere secluded with her and, 
Yeah. The day of the date arrived, and we planned on meeting at a home improvement store's car park at 6. That's kind of weird, but okay. I got myself looking good and brought protection. I was sure that I was going to have a great night. I just hoped the car would be big enough. Then my brother said he had to use our shared car. This was such a pain in the ass, as I would have to take out our older, shittier van-looking car. There went my chances. I told her I'd be in a white minivan. Then my brother, as if he was some kind of saint, told me that he didn't need to use the sedan anymore. Thanks, bro. You're literally a lifesaver, I thought. The sedan was way more cooler looking and roomy. The game was back on. I had a great feeling about the night ahead. Things were going my way. I was set to arrive at the home improvement store about five minutes ahead of the arranged meeting time. I thought I would drive around the parking lot to see if she was early too. While I was about to turn into the car park, I got an email from her saying, Are you here yet? I'll be there soon, I replied. I couldn't see anyone in the car park, so I didn't really understand why she was asking me if I was here yet. Then I saw a woman about 10 meters up ahead. I actually shuddered because this seemed all wrong. She didn't mention anything about bringing a friend. This was beginning to look a little sinister. I saw her sat in a minivan's passenger seat, chatting to some guy in the driver's seat. I drove a little away from the van and parked up and pulled my hat down over my face. I wanted to see what would happen when I messaged her. She got out of the minivan and spoke to someone in the car parked next to it. Then two other men came over and spoke to her. This really sent some chills up my spine. It was so crazy. What were her plans for me? Extortion? Blackmail? She emailed me. Well, are you close? Uh, I got a stomachache and I'm in the bathroom, I replied. A moment or two after I sent it, I saw a couple of men jump out of the minivan and walk into the home improvement store. They were probably going to check the bathrooms. Where are you? She replied. I stopped off at a convenience store nearby. She must have called the men back because in a matter of moments, they all got back into the van and the car. They left and headed the way I came. I drove in the opposite direction as fast as I could. I sent her a message saying that I was too sick to meet up and I never heard from her again. I have learned since not to give out personal information and always make sure the meeting place is somewhere neutral, with lots of people nearby. Don't bring too many personal possessions and items of ID, and if something doesn't feel right, always consult the police. I've been single my entire life, I really don't mind it, it's just how I've always been. And yet, I still buy Valentine's candy and a card every year. That simple thing saves my life. I moved to a small town right before starting high school. It was difficult trying to make new friends and adjusting to an entirely new place at the same time. By the time February rolled around, I was finally feeling as if I'd gotten into the groove of things. I had only made a handful of friends, and to my shock, the first time I was ever asked out on a date was a week before Valentine's Day. I felt awkward going out with a girl who I'd never spoken with before, so I turned her down. She got angry, claiming she had other options and was just being nice. That might be the case, but her extreme reaction confused me. When I was able to, I asked my friend Travis about it. Oh yeah. You die if you're single on Valentine's Day. Get your heart ripped out and everything. So, find a girlfriend for the day, he explained, and I scoffed at the idea. Come on, you don't expect me to believe that, do you? I asked, thinking he was just pulling a joke on the new kid. He acted as if he was just giving me some facts. He was looking at me as if I was crazy for not knowing about getting a date or dying. I told him he was crazy, but he just shook his head. It happens every year, 
someone gets their heart ripped out. It might not be in this town, but like, it's nearby, and it's always someone single. I guess you can risk it, but why? It's just one day, he said, trying to defend his point. This was before everyone had a cell phone in their pocket, so I couldn't look up deaths of people missing their hearts right then. I made a note to research it later, so I could call him out on his urban legend. I crossed my arms, still not buying what he was saying. That's stupid. Are you saying what? Someone knows you're single and kills you, I pressed. A person doesn't do it. Some sort of monster does. No one has lived after seeing it, but people said they heard drums and then found someone without their heart. Travis was again looking at me as if I should know all this. A Valentine's Day monster, really? Well, Christmas has Santa, and there's an Easter bunny, so why can't Valentine's Day have something? For the next ten minutes, I roasted his idea and belief in the Valentine's Day monster. At least he could take it all as a joke, even if he did believe the murders were real. He wasn't positive a monster was doing it, but couldn't offer up any other reasons behind the deaths, and he wasn't risking it. He already had a date lined up with a girl he didn't even like. I still thought the entire idea was dumb. The rest of the school didn't share my outlook. As the day slowly got closer and closer to the fated day, the students got paired up with each other, some done out of safety, others using the monster as an excuse to finally ask out their crush. I received a few pity offers, but I refused all of them as an act of rebellion against this stupid small town's tradition. I just watched as everyone started dating in fear of death. The store sold out of candy and carts pretty quick. Normally everywhere would be flooded with red and pink products. The shelves were barren a few days before the 14th. Now, I refused to accept any offers, and I didn't plan on asking someone out either. The school offered a program where you could buy sweetheart candies to be delivered to a class for a small fee. I didn't mind getting my new friends one each, all while making up silly names to put on the card of who they would receive it from. It was the only thing related to the whole day I gave into, aside from buying a box of chocolates for myself. The chocolates were just a normal box of assorted types from the grocery store I'd gotten with some money I made from doing chores. When I bought them, the cashier slapped a heart-shaped sticker on the box without my permission. A small one for someone to write who the box was meant for. With how crazy this town was over the holiday, I didn't blame her. By that time, I'd been so overexposed to anything Valentine-related just seeing the sticker put me off eating the chocolates. I shoved them in my backpack to forget about them until after the 14th was over. I really wish I'd taken the entire thing a bit more seriously. It wasn't until the night before Valentine's Day that I finally looked up the murders, finding them to be true. Dread started to form in my stomach as I scrolled through the library computer after school while waiting for my father to pick me up. I didn't find all the mysterious deaths, but enough to make me worried. Three people were found with their hearts missing. The police said that from the state of their bodies, they were killed on Valentine's Day, even though their bodies weren't found right away. An entire town was warning me about this, and yet I still sat in shock after finding out it was true. My father finally got me from school, but told me I needed to walk home the next day. I sat in the car, silently debating on what to do. He just chalked up my distressed state as normal teenage behavior. I didn't sleep that night. I tried thinking of names of students that might not have a date, all while knowing it was useless. When the clock turned midnight and it was officially the 14th, I nearly had a panic attack, convinced the monster would swoop in to take my heart. The only way I got through that night without a mental breakdown was to shift my train of thought back to what it was before looking up the murders. A Valentine's Day monster was stupid. It wasn't real. 
Some heartless store manager saw the murders and made up the story to sell more products through fear. That was it. It had to be it. I remained awake all night. In the morning, my mother noticed how I looked and offered to let me stay home. I refused, secretly hoping I could find a date if I went to school. The place was abuzz with new couples and gift exchanges. As I walked down the hallway, a few students looked at me with pity in their eyes. Most knew my single stance and how I would be the monster's top choice if it was real. No one went near me that day if they could help it. My few new friends awkwardly tried to find reasons to rush off if I tried talking to them. All of them having temporary new girlfriends gave them a good enough reason to be left out. My candy heart prank wasn't funny. Some thought it was, but I couldn't find the humor in anything that day. Instead, I spent it looking over my shoulder, expecting to hear drums at any second. The final bell rang and Travis was brave enough to walk over to me for a chat. I think he thought this was going to be our last conversation. The idea got him motivated enough to walk over, but not to find the words. Do you, uh, want to come over? I'm going out today, but maybe we can hang out beforehand. This is a really good show, and, uh, he trailed off, feeling awkward. It's fine, I'll just chill at home. My parents are going out and won't be home until after dinner, so I have the entire place to myself. That never happens. They finally think I'm old enough to be trusted to be left alone, I explained, determined to still not believe in this nonsense, even though I was terrified. Travis nodded, looking pale. He wasn't brave enough to press me on hanging out. After all, he was certain I was going to die that night. He didn't want to be around to see it. I'll talk to you tomorrow, I said, and gave him a shaky wave. He gave one back and started to hurry over to his new girlfriend. When you're a teenager, everything is a big deal. As I walked away from school towards home, I felt like I was walking towards my own death. The sky was overcast. It made me feel even more gloomy. I kept mocking myself for my mood as I walked along the neighborhoods that had become familiar to me over the past few months. Finding a small rock, I started to kick it as I walked, trying to take my mind off of the fear in my chest. A car started to drive along behind me with such loud music I could hear it thumping through the air. I watched it cruise by, a bit annoyed over the sound. If you're going to blast music, at least play something good and not something that just thudded. As the car kept going down the street, the music went with it, but a hint of thudding remained. I stopped, confused on why I could still hear the sound if the car was so far. When it finally turned out of sight, I realized the car wasn't the source of all the noise. My heart started to beat so fast and hard, it matched the thudding rhythm that I could swear was getting closer and closer. I didn't look behind me, or even get angry at myself for getting scared. I just ran down the street. I should have run up to one of the houses asking for help. I was so frightened, nothing rational came to mind. I ran like crazy, all while that beating followed. I wished this was a prank, but didn't stop running to find out. My mind was unable to work as my lungs burned from the mad dash. For a moment, I thought I was losing whatever was chasing me. I stumbled, nearly falling over a crooked sidewalk square in front of my house. I couldn't tell how close the thumping sound was over my own heart. Sweat poured down my face, and I felt faint. I slammed into my front door banging on it before I remembered my parents were out. I nearly screamed in frustration. The door was locked and my keys were buried under my books inside of my backpack. That thudding sound was all I heard. It was so close, it rumbled in my chest. My hands shook as I fumbled to get the zipper open. I was scared to death and couldn't keep my eyes open. Squeezing them shut, I felt around in my bag for my key. 
My hand brushed against it when a puff of wind came across my face. I smelled something sweet, and then the wind came again. To my horror, my mind clued into the fact it wasn't the wind, but something breathing on my face. It was too late. Even if I got my key, I couldn't unlock the door before whatever brought the heart-thumping sound took my heart too. I refused to open my eyes to see the monster I now knew to be real. I love the sound of your heart. It's a shame it's alone. Let me add it to the others. The voice that spoke wasn't some prank. It was twisted and beyond anything a human could make. My mind was racing. I felt a sharp tip of a claw poke my chest, leaving a small cut through my shirt. A cruel laugh came as I whimpered in fear, with my hand still in my backpack. I felt something that was not my books or my house key. A crazy idea came to mind. It was either that or death. So I grabbed a hold of the only thing I could think of. Yanking the box of chocolates from my bag, I held it out to the monster I still refused to see. My voice strained and shaking. I asked it a question I prayed would save my life. Will you be my Valentine's this year? My heart nearly beat out of my chest. Opening my eyes a crack, I could see the box in my hand, but not the creature that brought along countless heartbeats that mixed in with my own. I should have died. Instead of clawing out my heart, the twisted hand with razor-sharp nails reached out and took the box. I forced my eyes shut, my entire body shaking. Something brushed my face, causing me to tense up so much it hurt. That claw finger brushed some hair from my face with another cruel laugh. What a cute child you are. I'll accept this gift this year, but someday I'll be back to claim your heart. I bit down on my tongue, trying not to scream at that horrible voice. With one final laugh that rattled my bones, the thudding stopped. It took me forever before I gathered up the courage to open my eyes. Nothing was on the front step. I was alone. If it wasn't for the rip in my shirt, I would have thought the whole thing came about due to stress and lack of sleep. I didn't tell anyone what happened. I mean, who would believe me? I went to school for the first half of the day on the 15th. I had barely slept for two days and needed to take the rest of the day off, but I didn't want my friends to think I died. All of them looked shocked I'd lived. I just said I got lucky. The school moved on. The short-lived relationships caused by that day fizzed out. As time crept along, I started to dread knowing Valentine's Day was coming yet again. I bought more candy, roses, and a card, expecting a visit from a monster. I should have just gone along and dated someone, but somehow the idea of it was more stressful than dealing with a monster. I anticipated and feared Valentine's Day, only to have nothing happen. Nothing besides the fact that the gifts I addressed to the creature go missing overnight. As the years carried on, I kept buying different gifts with the same result. As I've gotten older, I've heard those terrible heartbeats faintly on Valentine's Day. Each year, the sound gets louder. I think this year is finally going to be when that monster shows itself. Again, just asking someone out may save my life, but... I think if the monster does show up, I'll ask it the question yet again. But this time, I will keep my eyes open. This happened when I was 25. Back then I had a girlfriend. This story takes place in her apartment. It was hers, but I was there often. I even had a key. So it was Valentine's Day. Our plans had been scuppered because her douche of a boss was making her work late again. 
but I was determined to give her a decent Valentine's Day, so I bought a load of ingredients and found a great recipe. I was getting ready to give it my all even though she knew I was a bad cook. It's the thought that counts though, right? So I let myself in, and I sit on the sofa, staring at the ingredients and trying to figure out how I was going to go about it. Then, I heard the doorbell. Awesome, she's getting off early after all, I thought as I went to answer the door. I didn't bother to look through the peephole since I was excited to see her, but when I opened the door, I saw a middle-aged man standing there, staring back at me. He was dressed as if he had just come from work. A salesperson, maybe? Going door to door? It wasn't quite right, though. He had chinos on and a polo shirt. When he saw me answer the door, he looked astounded. I remember he just kept blinking repeatedly. He didn't say anything. Hey, buddy, what can I do for you? I asked. Isn't this Aki Kawada's apartment? He stammered. That's my girlfriend's name. Yeah, that's right. What do you need? I asked. His eyes narrowed. He cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> I'm Aki Kawada's father. Who the hell are you? I went completely blank. I didn't know what to say. I mean, we had been dating for about three or four months and it was going so well, but I still hadn't been introduced to the family. And she hadn't really mentioned them. I was in love with her, and I wanted to show that I was serious about her when I eventually would meet her family. I just wasn't expecting today to be the day. I, am. Um, ah, uh, I muttered. I was panicking a bit. He took his shoes off and went right into the apartment and sat on the sofa. I had no idea what to do next, so I spent a couple of minutes pacing around by the door. He stood up and caught me doing this and gave me a weird look. There was an awkward silence. Uh, I think uh, Miss Aki will be back later than usual tonight, I'm afraid, I said. Did I just say Miss? Jesus, I thought. I was trying to be as polite as possible. No reply. He just glared at me. It looked like he hated me. Was uh, Aki expecting you today? Um, she was asked to stay later at the office, and I'm sure she wouldn't want to keep you waiting, I offered. It was like the anger was rising up in him. He was clenching his fist still no reply. He was ignoring me completely. Then suddenly he got to his feet. I didn't know what this guy was going to do. He still had his fists clenched. I had to prepare for what I thought was going to be an attack. Still ignoring me, he rushed into her bedroom and started rummaging around in there. Her father was rooting around through her dresser drawers by the time I got into the bedroom. He had his hands in her underwear drawer. I was thinking, well... Their family, maybe he loaned her something and he needs it back, or something. I mean, I was trying to convince myself that this was normal, but deep down I knew that something was wrong. What could I say, though? He was still there rummaging around when he spotted a framed photo of Aki and me. He stopped completely and snatched it up. It's a photo of Aki and me at an amusement park. It's a selfie I took, and in the photo she's kissing me on the cheek. This was super awkward now. He had hold of the photo, and he was walking towards me. I thought, yep, he's going to hit me, or at least yell at me, but he just walks back over to his shoes, puts them on, and leaves, still not saying a single word. It was like he lost his vocal cords or didn't want to speak in the apartment. Where's he gone? To get smokes or something? Is he coming back? I don't want to deal with her dad again tonight if that's his attitude towards me, I thought. I just tried to get cooking and keep my mind off it. I go over and double lock the door there. I didn't want him to burst in whenever he felt like. After about 40 minutes, the door shakes with the impact of someone trying to open it. Oh god, I think as I peer over towards the door nervously. Why is the door locked? Aki calls out. She's back! I run over to the door, open it and give her a hug. What's up? What's the matter? She asked. I guess she could tell I was stressed. N nothing really, it's just that your dad was here and he's a pretty intense guy. Aki looked at me. A look between irritation and sadness is the only way I could describe it. Don't say that. Is this a joke? She asked. No, he was, he was just here. I guess they had fallen out or something, but then she said, That's really not funny. My dad died back when I was in elementary school. 
I stood there completely gobsmacked. I described the man I met to her, and she confirmed that he looked and acted completely differently to her father. I'm certain that the man was up to something sinister that night. What was really creepy was the way that he knew where everything was in her apartment. It was like he had been in there before. He took a photo of me and Aki, and I guess he could have taken something from the underwear drawer too when I wasn't in the room with him. Needless to say, I offered Aki to move in with me right away, and then we got her moved into a new place shortly after that fateful Valentine's Day. If I wasn't there, if she had finished work on time, who knows what would have happened that day. When I was in my late sophomore through my junior year of high school, I was diagnosed with insomnia. I would sleep maybe an hour or two every 24 hour period, with sporadic binge sleeping rather randomly. Anyway, being awake at all time essentially made me alone a lot. So, one summer, I decided to walk to a gas station near my house to get a Gatorade or some shit. It's about 2am, no one is awake in my house, so I just walk out. I'm arriving at the gas station after a pretty uneventful walk, and I'm approaching that glow from the overhead lights, so things on the far edges are visible, but illuminated very poorly. The gas station has a really steep drive to enter from the main road, and the other end has a small pothole-filled parking lot with a narrow little alley that leads to an avenue. As a relative side note, I grew up in a very average middle-class neighborhood, not a suburb, not inner city, and really close to a country town neighborhood than anything else, I guess. Anyway, I start heading towards the front door, and in my peripheral vision, something moves in the darkness. So, not being very suspicious, I lazily turn to look. I can make out the shape of a person, and they're very rapidly materializing from out of the dark. It's a kid, probably a little older than me, and he's on a pretty fast clip jog. He jogs right up to me, and stops about half an arm's length away. We just stare at each other. The weird thing though, is that his upper lip is essentially shredded. It was like he fell off a motorcycle or something, and he was bleeding. He was also bleeding out of his nose, and his lower left eyelid was drooping down and full of blood. He had a bunch of blood splattered on his white t-shirt too, as if he'd sneezed or something. I began to say something, but before I could utter one syllable, he just moved to my left and kept running. Without saying a word, I went in got my drink and walked home. I was waiting to hear about it in the news the next day. I didn't. So, while hanging out with a close friend, I mentioned what had happened. We mulled it over for a bit, and then, he suggested something. He knew it was a wild shot in the dark, but he suggested that the kid didn't exist, and that I just really needed sleep. I hadn't even thought of that, and to this day, I don't know. When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started talking to me at the register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it and he asked if it was short for anything. I said yes and told him my full name. He asked what kind of name it is. My name originates from a Greek name, so I told him that because it's kind of interesting. He asked if I've ever been to the Greek festival in my city. I said no, and he replied with, Well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point I'm 16, and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up to the coffee shop every day and ask my co-workers when I would be coming in or if I was working that day. Eventually, he would start sitting at the seat right by the front door, waiting for me to come in. One day, he physically stood up and blocked my path and asked if he could buy me a coffee, and then he grabbed my hand. 
When I declined and tried to walk past to go in the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room. He would hang out there for hours just watching me and would try to constantly talk to me. My managers eventually had to tell me to work in the back until he left every day. And then he started sitting in the seat closest to the back room. After that, I had to start coming into work through the back door and staying there until he left. My co-workers had to tell him I quit, hoping he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls, and the cycle started all over again. He truthfully didn't seem that harmful, except for the time he grabbed my hand. But it was creepy, and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end, because no matter what we did or told him, it didn't stop. And he was there, just watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order. He was allowed in the plaza the coffee shop was in still, just obviously not in the coffee shop, and not near the patio by the front door and we usually saw him go to the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. It's very creepy and kind of scary as a 16 year old. So I used to work in a museum that closed fairly late. During the summer, we'd be open till 10 p.m., and living in the capital city, I unfortunately had to always pass very crowded places in order to get home. This happened when I stopped to get some food in a restaurant near a shopping center on my way home. As I left the tram, a guy immediately stopped me to ask for a donation. We had a very short conversation, but before we finished, two guys, seemingly older than me, I was 20, they could have been like 30 or something, that both had a very large, muscular build, stopped by and started asking me some weird questions. They were both holding beers, but neither of them acted drunk per se, and that means they were creeps by nature. At first, they commented on my blue hair, telling me how much they love it, which is fine. Then they asked if the guy that was still awkwardly standing there was my brother, and so on. Thankfully, they left soon after. I made my donation and started making my way towards the restaurant again. I didn't notice them at first due to the place being overcrowded, but right in front of the restaurant, they stopped me again. This time, their questions got a lot creepier. They asked if I'd be willing to perform all kinds of sexual acts on them since they're here to have fun, and I was apparently very attractive to them. They kept being awfully pushy, saying I should do stuff to one of them right on the spot. I tried to walk away, but they just blocked my path. Then they asked for my number. Me being anxious and hoping they'll just let me go if I obey, I gave it to them. And indeed, they let me pass. As soon as I entered the restaurant, I started getting spam called, so I immediately blocked their numbers. I messaged my boyfriend, asking him to pick me up. I don't think I've ever felt that scared. Planning to stay inside the restaurant until my boyfriend came didn't work out, however, as one of them later literally entered the completely full restaurant, came up to me, and started inappropriately touching me, hugging me, and even tried to kiss me. I was so dumb that I didn't scream or anything. I just tried to push him away, but otherwise, I was just frozen in place and insanely scared due to his large build. It's insane to me that I clearly tried fighting him off as everyone around just looked away or silently watched. I even let out, help, and stop a couple of times. Clearly, he got tired of that and decided to take it one step further by literally dragging me out full force. I felt like at that point, I'll just get kidnapped and no one's gonna do anything. Thankfully, after all that time, a group of girls I'd never met before entered the restaurant and said something along the lines of having me go because we all have plans for the evening together. And thank God he just let go and left without a word. 
It baffles me that I could have gotten kidnapped or God knows what else in the middle of a place completely full of people. And needless to say, I hugged those girls like I've never hugged anyone before. And I left them only like half an hour later when my boyfriend finally came. I left my job and never returned to that place. Being awfully paranoid even now, two years later. I hope you enjoyed that guys. I want to give a special thanks to the original author of My Town Believed in a Valentine's Day Monster. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos, as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Vicky Howell, Gloria, Ashley Juster, Celsa Rundle, Merciful Humming, Carol Zaffirano, Melissa Moore, Dixie Busby, Michelle Green, Misty Rakur, Michelle Brooks, Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindop, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Ballard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scout Monk 405, Z. Harris, Unladylike 13, Ventura C.A., Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D., Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M., Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, 
The Barry, LJ, Fiona Xbox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.